So starting off with, uh, this is really uh, about Yarmouth's first tourist hotel boom. And uh, the hotels that I'm talking about are the Markland Hotels, and, and their history stretches between 1900 and 1934. The map that you're seeing on your screen is, uh, is a map that uh, the Markland Hotel Company produced to go with, with one of their uh, brochures that they would send out. And um, if we uh, look at this map here, you can see Markland Heights. I'm highlighting that area right now. So this is where the Markland Hotel was up here. Of course, we have uh, Cape for Shoe with the lighthouse out here at the end of uh, the East Cape and then John's Cove. But anyway, uh, a, a pretty neat little map. R really what you had at the, uh, at the end of Yarmouth's Peak uh, of its uh, uh, sailing uh, activities, which was in uh, 1879, the entrepreneurs of Yarmouth uh, could see that uh, times were changing. And uh, looking for new opportunities, they started looking in the direction of the tourism uh, uh, markets. And in the late 1800s, the traffic between Yarmouth, Boston, and New York began to uh, increase significantly. Yarmouth became the, the gateway to Nova Scotia since we were at the end of the uh, uh, railway when, when it was eventually built. And uh, one of these uh, gentlemen who uh, was instrumental in getting this all going was uh, Lauren Baker. And, and Lorne became uh, one of the principal uh, operators of the uh, Yarmouth Steamship Company. And he also became uh, one of the partners in the Grand Hotel, because of course, with all these tourists coming to Yarmouth, well, uh, we needed accommodations for them to stay. And the Grand Hotel was built in 1893. Uh, with accommodations for about 100 guests. In 1896, right across the harbor from Yarmouth, uh, you had the Bayview Hotel that was built. And, uh, and the Markland Hotels came along beginning four years later. So first of all, uh, just talking a little bit about uh, Cape for Shoe and, and tourism. And in this particular picture, it's from about 1900. And you can see a group of tourists on the rocks here below the, the lighthouse. And they're quite nicely uh, uh, dressed. Uh, the ladies have very nice fine hats. Uh, this is the original house that was down at Cape for Shoe that was built in 1840. And an interesting feature that some may not have seen before, but the house was actually connected by a covered wooden walkway, which was about 90 feet long, and that connected the lighthouse to the residence. And then here on the lawn beside the house is a very interesting feature as well, which I still keep trying to figure out exactly what it is, but it, it looks like it's a, a, a gazebo, which it could possibly have been there for the purposes of the, uh, of, of the Taurus. So the lighthouse, ever since its uh, beginning in 1840, uh, it was a popular spot for people to come and visit. The breakwater was not built until 1873. But in these days, just about everybody had a boat and everybody was very proficient in sailing their boats. And so uh, a, a lot of folks uh, uh, came out to Cape for Shoe to visit and to uh, take part and enjoy the beach at John's Cove. You have to remember, uh, and, and this of course is a picture of John's Cove, you have to remember in, in these days, uh, the, the road infrastructure through Yarmouth County was, was very poor and to travel by road was, was quite, uh, quite a chore. 
uh, everybody made their way around uh, by boat. And uh, from the town of Yarmouth, the, the nearest spot to go to enjoy a nice sandy beach was just up the harbor at, uh, at John's Cove. Now in this picture, which is taken by uh, one of the Parker brothers, uh, famous photographers in Yarmouth, it's hard to tell, but down in this corner here, the sand is all uh, walked over by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of feet from people walking by there. And uh, the next area we're going to take a look at here in detail is, is this area up above, up above here. And so this is a closer view. Uh, this is where the wharf was that uh, in, in later years, beginning in, uh, as far as I could tell, around 1890, maybe even as early as 1885, there were uh, boats like the Juno, which would sail from Yarmouth to John's Cove. And, and this is actually a notice from 1895. And uh, the Juno, the fare back then was 15 cents one way. A return ticket was 25 cents. And, and basically it, it left every couple hours from uh, the wharf in town and, and then came out to John's Cove and dropped the passengers off here on this wharf. Now this property was owned by the Foot family back in those days. And this building right here with the, with the overhanging roof in the front was actually a restaurant that was run by the Foot brothers back in those days. And this is actually a swing set that they had out on the point. And so it, it, it was a, a very uh, a popular uh, spot. The next picture that we're gonna take a look at is another area of that same uh, big picture. Uh, and it shows a very interesting scene at the corner of John's Cove. You can see the lighthouse in the background. This is actually the schoolhouse that was built on Cape Fershu back in 1870. But if you can make this out here, what this is, is this is a steam powered merry-go-round set up at John's Cove in 1895. You can see the little horses all around the outside of the merry-go-round, the pole in the middle with the supporting wires going down to the outside. And this over here is the steam boiler. And so the, the steam is coming out of the boiler, the, the machine is being powered. And over here on the beach, we have a, a, a number of patrons who are, I guess, waiting their, their turn. Now, an operation like this uh, would have been uh, privately owned. Uh, it would have been something that could be dismantled and, uh, and moved either by barge uh, or over the roads. But you can see that obviously John's Cove was that popular that they would actually set this, this up at, at the time. This is uh, an, another uh, notice in the paper from 1893, and it's talking about the steam tug Uncle Sam with her picnic barge, which could accommodate between 75 and 150 people making trips uh, out to Cape Fershu. And, uh, and, and this picture is from 1892. Uh, and again, it's a, a, a obviously a, a men's group. Uh, there's no ladies in this photograph, a few, uh, a couple of young boys. But uh, these gents are out on the beach at, at Markland enjoying a, a, a nice chowder picnic. 
But the, our main subject today is, is the Markland Hotels. And, and this is one of the many uh, fabulous photographs we have of the uh, Markland Hotels. This is the road uh, that goes to the lighthouse in the fore foreground of the picture. Uh, a lifeboat on the beach here. And up above this first building is the first Markland Hotel. Well, it, it, it was established and operational around 1900. And then on the hill, we have the second Markland Hotel, which was built in, uh, in 1903. So let's uh, zoom in here uh, just, to, just to put things in perspective of where you're looking at. Uh, here's an aerial view of Cape Verschu. Uh, you can see the breakwater in the distance the road going out to the lighthouse. And where this arrow points is at the bottom of what they call Markland Heights Lane. And so uh, up at the top of Markland Heights Lane, there's a couple cottages. These were two of the original cottages on Cape Verschu. And where this block is, where I put this block is whereabouts the, uh, the, the second Markland Hotel would have been located. Again, uh, to put things in perspective, I've included this map here. Uh, this is our road heading out to the lighthouse. This is the corner where you have Markland Heights Lane going up the hill and going the other way, you have Kai Lane which uh, leads down to where some of the other cottages located. This is the first hotel and it's located right on the road. And right across from the hotel, it says stable. This was the barn, this was the barn. Uh, the, the hotel had its own farm. Uh, they supplied uh, many of their own uh, uh, goods. Uh, and up above the uh, first hotel, you have the second hotel uh, that again was built further up on, on the hill. Zooming in on our earlier photograph, we can take a look at uh, the first Markland Hotel. And there was a, a gentleman by the name of Robert Power, and he had a farm on, on Cape Verschu back in the 1880s. And this part of the hotel is that original farmhouse. This part here was the addition that they put on when they first started marketing as the Markland Hotel. This next picture here is again another uh, picture by Mr. Parker. Uh, the gentleman on the steps of the Hotel Annex is uh, Ansel Crosby. And Ansel Crosby is the guy that was instrumental in starting the Markland Hotels. Ansel had been, uh, Captain Ansel Crosby, I should say, had been a, a sea captain, and he was on uh, on various vessels uh, up until about 1885, when it, uh, it appears that he decided he was going to retire from the sea. And in 1888, uh, Ansel bought a, a bunch of land on Cape Verschu, mainly from the Sweeney property, uh, but he also bought the old uh, Power family farm that was on the main drag going out to the Cape. Again, this is the road, even as it exists today, this is the same road that runs out to the Cape. Now, somewhere along the way, Ansel decided that, again, uh, Cape for Shoe was so wonderful and, and beautiful uh, that he figured with this tourism uh, boom that was going on that, uh, you know, people would be looking for a place to stay on the Cape. 
And probably in the years before 1900, there had even been some folks who had boarded at various places. And there may have been some folks that even rented out their small houses as, as cottages during the summer months. But somewhere along the way, he, he ran into a, a, a gentleman by the name of uh, John Love, who was from Nashville, Tennessee. And he and John formed a company. Uh, Mr. Love was in the uh, lumber business in Nashville, and, and he had uh, accumulated a, a quite a bit of wealth. And somewhere along the way, uh, he and, and uh, Ansel Crosby got together and started doing business as Love and Crosby in the, in the late 1890s. And uh, they were partners uh, when, when this annex was built and they got the first Marklin Hotel going. They did such a great bunch of business that they decided that they were going to build a, a second uh, far grander hotel on the heights above uh, Markland. Uh, this was quite a, uh, a, a project. It required a lot of extensive uh, uh, landscaping and, and foundation work to put this hotel up there. Um, by now, they uh, had reformed a new company called the Markland Hotel Company. And in addition to Mr. Love and Ansel Crosby as the general manager, they also had Jane Burrell, who was the vice president. And she was from the, the Yarmouth Burrell family. And uh, uh, Robert McKay, who was uh, the, the treasurer as well. And so they, they built this new hotel and they started to, to market it. It was well known as a great place to come and escape the heat. And even today, I, I, I notice with great interest uh, in our new vehicles that have temperature uh, readings for the outside, how I can leave Yarmouth on, on a given day and, and drive out to the Cape and it's five degrees cooler. <laughs> this was in the days before air conditioning. And, and you can imagine for folks coming from the cities of Boston and New York, how escaping the, the heat of the cities to come to a place like Cape Verchu and spend a uh, a, a bit of time was, was, was very refreshing. It was well known that there were no flies or, or insects of any type on the Cape back in those days. Uh, there was very few uh, wooded areas. Pretty much everything was, was just pasture. It was, was pretty much all farmland. And uh, this salt air elixir, as they called it in their promotions, was promoted as a cure for folks who were convalescing from uh, lung illness or, or suffering from hay fever. And so anyway, it, 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 uh, it again grew quickly in, in popularity. There's lots of photos of the exterior of the Markland Hotel. Unfortunately, uh, none of the interior that I've ever been able to come across. Um, I, I like to think that maybe someday uh, one of our friends in the United States uh, who, who may have had uh, relatives earlier on who visited this place might come across a box of photos and send it to us. But uh, anyway, uh, we'll wait for that day, hopefully. There is, however, uh, an inventory that was done of the hotel in 1912, and it uh, gives us a, a, a bit of a description of, of what the interior was like. And uh, on the main floor where you have this area here and you see the larger windows on this floor, uh, there was uh, the main reception area and hallway. It had several tables and chairs. There was a large display case 
in which you could find your Yarmouth souvenirs and your Merklin Hotel souvenirs, china and small gifts and stuff. Off the main floor was a carpeted par parlor with, uh, with uh, uh, chairs and tables and, and rockers with a large fireplace and a, and a large mantle uh, mirror. It even talks about uh, the pictures that were uh, and paintings that were on the walls, uh, many of, of horses and, and one with lions in it and one with tigers. The main floor also had the uh, hotel office and the dining room, the kitchen and pantry, along with four guest rooms on the main floor. Now, this is a picture of uh, what you see today if you go up and have a look there, because it's amazing how much of the foundation of the Markland Hotel is still there. And uh, it, it's, it's really quite remarkable that a, a piece of Yermis tourism history that is so significant still exists today. Uh, in, in these rocks and uh, if only they could be cleared away, what, what a story, what a sight uh, uh, it, it could be. In, in these early days, uh, all they had, uh, they had two options for getting to the Markland Hotel and, and this was the small wharf that was down below the, the hotels and uh, uh, they could only get to this wharf at high tide. Uh, otherwise, uh, they would have to go to the wharf in, in John's Cove, uh, and, and that could be re uh, reached uh, re regardless of the tide. Uh, very interesting here, the, the folks seem to be unloading some kind of a trunk from the boat. You'll see a number of people walking up the pier. Difficult to see, I know, but this is a team of oxen uh, with a cart attached. And there's a gentleman in the back of the cart loading bags because uh, uh, it was a, a good walk up that hill and all your bags would be taken up by, by ox cart. Uh, there's another team of oxen here to the right of the photograph and, and just a couple uh, stray cows uh, in that other part. <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was quite something. Um, uh, and again, between John's Cove and the Markland Hotels, there was enough traffic coming out of the town of Yarmouth that in 1900, it seems that there were uh, two small steamers that were taking passengers uh, back and forth uh, between John's Cove and the, and the wharves in Yarmouth. Um, and then uh, in, in 1901, according to the Department of Marine, uh, you had the, the Juno, you had another one called the Island Gem, capable of carrying 40 passengers and the tourist, which could carry 38. And then in uh, 1901, uh, they built another steamer, a bigger one called the Markland, uh, and it was capable of carrying 75 passengers. Um, Captain Crosby, uh, he was a hands-on general manager uh, so not only did he manage the day-to-day -day operations of the hotel, but he also uh, usually uh, operated the, the boats back and forth between Yarmouth and, and the piers on Cape Verchu. Notice uh, the number of people crowded on to this boat. Obviously, back in those days, I, I don't think they had many rules regarding uh, uh, passenger capacity. And then this uh, boat down here was a boat who was operated by one of the one of the domes. 
And, and again, this was operated in, in around the 1912 uh, period, 1914 period. Uh, again, another uh, view of the hotel up on the hill. This is hotel number uh, two. And uh, some of the activities, uh, there was lots of stuff to do when you got out to the Markland. And uh, boating was a, was a very popular activity. Other stuff that you could do, uh, the Yarmouth uh, Band uh, often played at the Markland Hotel. And typically they had uh, music there. Uh, a couple nights a week through the entire summer season. Uh, their season generally would start on uh, Victoria Day and then uh, run through until uh, the end of October. Um, occasionally there were special events and, and they mentioned on a couple of occasions having fireworks. I... I uh, um, I have this down here because deep sea fishing was a very popular activity and, and this shows uh, the catch that uh, this gentleman has, has uh, got on his particular uh, trip. The hotel, there were a variety of board games that were available and, uh, and, and you could pass the time in the sitting room with a board game. The, the main floor uh, lounge or games room, uh, it was uh, uh, a room that had a billiard table and a piano in it uh, with a number of tables, lamps, and chairs. There was uh, lounge chairs uh, that were provided and you could relax in the lounge chairs uh, on the hotel porch or on the lawn. And uh, again, the view was amazing. So just sitting there watching the shipping activity up and down Yarmouth Harbor was quite entertaining. There are a number of outdoor sporting events like tennis and lawn bowling, croquet, and they used to have uh, baseball games. There was a, a rifle range uh, on the property where you could practice your marksmanship and do skeet shooting as well. Um, I mentioned uh, the boating, you could uh, rent canoes. There, there of course was a lot of uh, surf bathing and, and uh, uh, people enjoying the water on outer False Harbor or in John's Cove. And in the plans uh, of the future, because uh, again, uh, everything was just uh, really great during these years. The business was incredible. And there were talks of expansion and even including a golf course at one point. The hotel had uh, wide trails, which wrapped all around the Cape and sighted along these trails were some rest stops with rustic seats and, and even a couple small shelters uh, with quaint names like Love's Grotto and uh, Vikings Udden and stuff like that. So uh, uh, hiking around the Cape, uh, walking across the breakwater, and of course going out to the lighthouse uh, were all uh, uh, popular things to do. And of course, speaking of the lighthouse, uh, here we have a fantastic shot uh, from 1906. And this is obviously a large group of folks uh, from the hotels. Uh, you can see how nicely uh, people are attired. Uh, again, uh, a, a lot of these folks were coming from Boston and, and New York and, and, and came from uh, fairly, uh, fairly good backgrounds. Uh, in the background here, uh, this helps you date the photograph because this was the fog alarm building that was built in 1891. 
And uh, again, it's it's before the new lantern was put on the top of the lighthouse, which was in 1908. So again, uh, a, a, a group of people down there. Uh, another popular spot to walk to was Shipstern. And uh, you could see the bug light in the background. This of course is Bunkers Island. We've got a steamship which has just gone up the harbor past the, uh, the end of Shipstern. And uh, Shipstern looks pretty good for, for these days. Uh, it's it's uh, not as easy to get out to as it would have been in the past, but people could actually walk out there from the hotels and you were close enough to the uh, ships coming up the harbor that you could actually talk to the people as as they would go by on their on their way to town. It was quite a group. Uh, they uh, they even had a, a little uh, a club or fraternity that they they called the uh, the pirates, the Markland Pirates, and and this is a a bit of a, a brochure that they put out for their club. Uh, again, a number of of names here included all of these folks from uh, from the, the United States, except down at the bottom, we have Jane Burrell, who I mentioned was the vice president of the Markland Hotel Company from Yarmouth. So it was it was quite a fraternity, quite uh, quite popular. I, I mentioned uh, the hotel had its own farm. And, and this is, again, one of the classic photographs we have of the Markland Hotels. This, again, is the road to Cape Fershoe. And up on the hill, we have hotel number two. And this is the first hotel down below. We'll take a little uh, closer look at that. Uh, here we have the windmill which supplied the water up to the hotel. Uh, again, this is the first hotel. This part is actually the original farmhouse. The roof we see here is, is uh, the roof of the annex. And this is the barn. So you can see there was a good sized barn. They, they usually kept between eight and 12 cows as, as well as, uh, uh, as a few uh, cattle for beef some some pigs and 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 naturally hens for uh and chickens as well out here you notice the the large uh, hay wagon it's on the lawn and over here i've i've pointed to a couple uh rocks and when you drive down to Cape for shoe next time you go down as you go by the road for for Markland Heights Lane you can notice that on both sides of that road, there's a couple fairly large rocks. And, and these are the same rocks that we see in this photograph that are, are still there today. Although the, the road itself is considerably better than what was at that time, not much more than, than a, a horse and buggy or cart path. Here we have a, a, a shot from up on the top of Markland Heights. Uh, again, it was mainly pasture um, and a few of the cows. This is from 1910, and they're actually advertising looking for a, a farmer to take charge of the farm uh, for the company. And again, a shot of, uh, of uh, some of the folks out on the Cape with one of those big hay wagons. But in this one, they're, they're loading up eelgrass. The rooms and, and service at the Markland Hotel. Rooms were advertised as ranging from about $8 to $15 a week with uh, special rates in the spring during June and, and at the end of the season in October. Uh, they made every attempt they could to make the... Uh, the, the guests feel comfortable, nice airy rooms, comfortable beds. And it was said that nobody ever slept better than they did at the Markland Hotel. 
in that refreshing clean sea air. Uh, this group of ladies here is the housekeeping staff that they had at one time in the 1900s. And all that, uh, all that laundry, all the bedding and stuff, the, the Markland as well as the Bayview Hotel kept this laundry in business and it was located in, in uh, Overton. And this house where the laundry was located is still standing today. Just talking a little bit more about the interior of the hotel. Uh, there were nine guest rooms on the second and third floors. Each floor had a bathroom with running water. The fourth floor had eight guest rooms. The rooms had uh, your typical stuff, a coat tree, a small bureau table, a couple chairs, and of course the ever important uh, commode. A nice large bed in each room and extra cots were available. Anyway, uh, they, they wanted uh, folks to feel just like uh, home and, and uh, they, they did everything they could to try to meet the, the guests every desire. Of course, the hotel provided uh, uh, income uh, for, for some of the residents of Cape Verschu uh, who worked there seasonally in, in a number of, of positions, but just the landscaping uh, crew alone was quite a bit. Water collection and storage. I mentioned uh, the windmill, which was located uh, down below the, the second hotel. It pumped water up to these two water tanks at the back of the hotel. And in addition, you can see the pipes coming down off of the roof because they would have captured rainwater off the roof. As, as another source of water. And then from these tanks, the, the, the gravity flow in, into the uh, hotel provided uh, the water for the bathrooms and the, and the kitchens. These were uh, good times. Uh, and by 1908, uh, they were filled to capacity and uh, they, the owners said, well, let's, let's go ahead, let's expand. And uh, expand they did. They built this piece on the southern end of the hotel in, in 1908. And it contained uh, uh, another half a dozen bedrooms and, and, some, uh, and, and another small lounge. Notice the beautiful landscaping. Notice the, the, the fantastic rock wall here going around the front of the property with the pathway and staircases, which led down to the road below. This rock wall is the same rock wall that you see in this picture here. And you can even see in the center of the picture, hopefully the, the resolution is good enough but uh, there's a lead pipe coming out of this rock wall, and that was to help water drain off of this, this lovely lawn that they had up there. Anyway, things were so good, they had to publish a notice in the paper telling people that uh, they were filled to capacity and could folks please look elsewhere for, for other spots to stay. Again, here is another picture. Uh, these pictures were taken uh, the summer before last. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, so two years ago. And, and again, you see that rock retaining wall. This would have been all the lawn in front of the Markland Hotel behind it. Uh, you can see trees are now growing up through this. And, and again, uh, things are, are kind of a bit of a mess up there, but it's amazing how much has survived. Now this is the hotel showing the north end of the hotel as it was originally constructed. Uh, this was the original dining room on the north end of the hotel. And you can see the road leading up, uh, up to the hotel itself. 
this is the same road today. And of course, if you drive by there now that uh, everything is so lush and green, uh, you can barely make out this retaining wall. But um, in the spring of the year, uh, it's, it's quite noticeable. And I'm sure many of you have driven by there and, and taken a look at this. The close-up of, of the wall is kind of interesting because in between the stones in the mortar, they've actually put lines in through the mortar there to give it some kind of an additional relief or something. But anyway, all of that stuff is, is there at, at this point in time. So this is the, the north end again. Uh, this was the original bump out on the north end, but this was an extension that was added in, in later years. Uh, again, it's got a fairly uh, high uh, retaining wall at this corner. And again, this image here shows some of the stonework that's from that wall as it still looks today. And then finally, this is the last extension or, or uh, the addition that was made to the northern extension. So they actually added a, another floor entirely. And they've got a, a balcony out here now and uh, some large windows in this. Uh, this became the dining room, which uh, could actually hold a, a typically 150 people. But uh, on occasions, they had upwares of, of 200 people that they, uh, they, they plated there for meals. So there was uh, two working kitchens. They had a couple pantries. Uh, they were really pushing the uh, wholesome cuisine. And of course, seafood was a major item on the, uh, on the menu. And with uh, Yarmouth Bar just a, a short distance across the breakwater, uh, you could get not just fresh seafood, but you could get your, your, your salt herring and, and salt uh, cods, uh, your smoked fish as well, your kippers, and your, your fin and hattie. Uh, so as I, I said, uh, the dining room had typically about 150 people at 30 tables. This again is, uh, is some of that Markland Hotel uh, uh, foundation. Now, when they did the major expansion, the other big thing they did was they built a, a long bridge. So uh, from that original short little pier that we saw in the earlier photograph, they now added this long pier, which ran out to the, uh, to the channel uh, far enough so that the, the boat could, uh, could arrive there and drop their passengers off at the end of this, this pier. You notice down the pier, we have poles with lines going down the poles. These were for, uh, there was a little shack at the end of the pier and you had a telephone inside of it. And from there, uh, when, they, when they docked the boat, they could call up to the, uh, to the hotel and, uh, and, and get some assistance down for the passengers and, and, their, and their baggage. 1909 uh, was a big year uh, in addition uh, to the expansion that they had earlier. In 1909, they've now got electricity. And uh, the article talks about the fact that the hotel, uh, several of the cottages, because again, these cottages along here, some were privately owned but a few were owned by the hotel and they would be rented out as well. Uh, if you were staying in a cottage, you could eat at the hotel or, or you could even have meals brought in for you. But this is the view from the top of the hotel, looking back towards Yarmouth Bar, there's the old breakwater in the distance. 
and you can see the the power poles running down along the road bringing electricity to the cape which interestingly enough back in those days was supplied by the Yarmouth Street Railway Company because uh, as we know we had a electric street railway in those days and uh, they were actually generating enough power that it not only met their needs but they were able to to sell off some of that electricity as as well everything was going great until we got to about 1913 1914 and then the hotel and the markland company fell on hard times and it was a combination of factors you know it's 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 kind of hard to say exactly my personal feeling is is maybe they had expanded uh, a little too fast, uh, built a little too much debt up, and and all of a sudden now, uh, of course, we're we're looking at the start of hostilities for World War One, and and that is just going to turn everything upside down. Of course, people are no longer going to be traveling, and and they're not going to have. The, the funds to spend on things like vacations and stuff. So anyway, they wound up uh, declaring bankruptcy and uh, the Yarmouth Herald on the 12th of May, 1914, had the following notice, which basically is selling off everything that, uh, that they had, that they owned. But, they didn't. They didn't sell it off. They, they, uh, I, I guess, were probably unable to find a, a buyer. Probably unable to find a, a satisfactory offer. And uh, through the war years, uh, they they did little or no business. And uh, the the they actually closed the building entirely for six years uh, from about 1917 till about 1923, when all of a sudden, uh, Mr. Love, uh, he decided that he was going to uh, give it another try. He, he thought this was a special place. And so in 1923, uh, after it had been closed up for about six years, they totally went through the place cleaned it all up and remarketed it as the uh, as the Yarmouth Inn and uh, they they hired a, a special chef they had a, a number of uh, of, of uh, events planned uh, and at one point uh, it was even suggested that some of the Nova Scotia officials from Halifax were coming down to, to visit as well as a number of tourist associations and, and groups from the United States coming over. So they, they attempted to rebrand it. And uh, unfortunately, history doesn't explain what happens. But uh, all of a sudden, in the middle of the summer of 1923, uh, there was a notice in the paper that suddenly announced that the Yarmouth Inn was now under new management. And so there, there was a, a, a complete turnover of, of staff. And uh, I, I, I got to think, again, it was a combination of factors. Uh, travel had changed. Uh, you know, roads were getting better. There were other things that people could do, but I also think that it was probably also one of those unfortunate Cape for Shoe summers where the weather is just fog, fog, fog all the time. And uh, it, it just did not work out for them. This is one of the last pictures of the Markland Hotel and uh, it, it, it says a lot. Um, after 1923, 
the hotel remained closed and they they tried for years to find new investors um occasionally the 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 hotel would be opened up uh by the local uh, uh caretaker and and they would do uh, uh a, a few events there some of the cape for shoe residents recall going to the hotel in these years and and doing some square dancing and stuff but eventually time the environment and trespassers began to take their toll on the property so in this picture here we can see the lawn is of course overgrown it's not being kept up the steps are starting to fall apart. There's actually supposed to be a banister coming down from here, and it's not there. Um, and so this is one of the last shots of the hotel. And in 1934, Yarmouth Herald reported that one of Yarmouth's historic landmarks, a pride of Yarmouth and a familiar sight for many arriving in the harbor, had been torn down, ending this, this exciting time in, in Cape for Shoe history. So that is the story of the Markland Hotels. And uh, today, uh, if you go up there again, like I said, you're, you're uh, uh, treated with an amazing sight of some of the foundations that exist. And of course, the view will never change. But with all the trees and everything, this was the only shot that I could take from up there where I could have a clear view of some of the some of the site in the distance. And of course, this is again the road to the lighthouse and, and John's Cove would be in that area. So that's the end of the presentation.